everyone. I'm John Lynn, the founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today. We're excited to bring you another in our series of interviews with top leaders in healthcare IT. Today, we have two special guests. We have Chris Logan. He's executive health care advisor at VMware, and Matt Douglas, Chief Enterprise Architect at Sentara and Optimum Health. Welcome, Chris. Welcome, Matt. Awesome. Thanks for having us, John. Welcome. Yeah, so excited to have this discussion. Uh, but before we dive into the project that Matt, you know, that you and your team implemented, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, Sentara. Um, Sentara Healthcare has been around for over 100 years. Um, we have... Uh, 13 major health facilities, some are a million square feet, Norfolk General's uh, a million square feet. We, we basically service majority of Virginia and North Carolina. Um, myself, I've been a, a, a in healthcare for several years, but I've also been a cloud uh, evangelist for Microsoft and VMware Hyperconverged geez, for, for over eight years when cloud and hyperconverged wasn't cool. <laughs> uh, that's back when I was a tech guy, right? I mean, I'm literally a tech guy on Twitter <laughs> and lose a, a little bit of that every day. But <laughs> that's when I first started with learning about VMware. So I guess we, we both go back that far. Great to have you here, Matt. And Chris, uh, want to tell us a little bit about yourself and VMware? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, VMware, everybody knows it. It's a very much a household name at this point. Yeah. Started way back in the data center and moved well beyond the walls of the data center to create business agility for our customers to really satisfy their needs, especially in healthcare, really ensuring that we're putting the patient at center and allowing customers like Centera to reach those patients wherever they are in their care journey. Now, myself, I've been with VMware for almost six years now. Um, in the capacity that I'm in, I act as a trusted advisor for our customers and a trusted advisor back to VMware. So they understand the needs of what the industry is looking to accomplish so that we develop the right products and solutions and speak the language of our customers to ensure they provide the best patient care possible. Prior to my time at VMware, I was a chief technology and chief information security officer for two large health systems for well over a decade and another decade worth of experience before that in many different industries and verticals. You're trying to age yourself, I think, but <laughs> you still look good. Yeah. yeah, you look great, Matt. It's hard to imagine you've accomplished all that. <laughs> so, uh, Matt, uh, tell us about what was your situation with your legacy virtual solution, and why did you choose to move to the VMware vSphere and vSAN running in? You know, and I love that you're you're running it in the Azure cloud as well. So, what was your you know what was your previous solution, and why yeah. did you choose this? You know, previously, um, Epic, which is one of the largest EMRs, um, we're actually truly the largest EMR, we were running on legacy AIX hardware. We were running a, an alternative presentation layer solution. Um, it didn't scale uh, to meet our needs. We, we have over 16,000 to 20,000 clinicians leveraging our EMR at any given time. And in order to, to maintain that, in order to to grow the capacity, it was all physical infrastructure. It was all in, independently managed, independent servers. Moving to vSphere and uh, vSAN allowed us to do consistency where we could actually update the images, do maintenance um, at, at any given time without having to, to take down an entire system. Uh, it, it also allowed us performance enhancements, you know, in order to increase to the scale that we're, we're serving now, physical infrastructure would, would have never uh, met that. So moving to the VMware, vSAN, uh, now, um, you know, RDSH um, platform has given us a lot more consistency. Yeah. So I, I, I love the, th the idea, and I think most you know, CTOs in healthcare would love to do this, but this is pretty unique, right, Chris? Uh, you know, that they moved Epic to this virtual solution, or you know, are we seeing this happening a lot, or where are we at on that? I, I would say that the trend is starting to pick up a lot more now. Um, you know, when I first implemented Epic years and years ago, you were bound and constrained by the hardware and it had to be localized. Yeah, Epic because wouldn't was, allow it, right? <laughs> they, well, first they wouldn't allow it, but the experience would be horrible. I mean, just the okay. sheer nature of what's necessary to run that, that behemoth of an application, it has to be localized for that matter. I think as we've seen technology grow and from a VMware perspective specifically, we're trying to get people the freedom to run any application on any cloud on any device, right? So by, decouple, uh, by decoupling the application's need for specific hardware and putting it in that virtual infrastructure, in that virtual fabric, 
we're giving that freedom for people now to think about how they want to run those applications, where they want to run them, and when they want to run them, to be quite honest with you, because we're trying to improve that user experience. We're trying to look at the operational models and simplify, really kind of smooth out how you operationalize it, because there's going to come a time, and I think what COVID proved to us is that if you've got to scale up real fast, you're not going to get another box delivered to you. You need to take advantage of another operating model, and the cloud presents that. So being able to look at the application portfolios or run them in a hybrid model really starts to solve some of these problems that healthcare providers are being faced with. So we're seeing much more of this start to become an uptick for a lot of different reasons, that operational efficiency for one, but also for resiliency purposes, right? Because we no longer practice medicine in a central location. If you think about you know, the state of medicine and modern care delivery today, it's spread across the land because you're trying to meet that patient where they are in their care delivery using technology to solve those problems is really getting much more of that care delivered where it's needed most. And I think Matt and Santera has done a fantastic job of being really, you know, groundbreaking, you know, the, 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 the thought leaders and the front runners and actually taking this concept of how we deliver this application and changing it to meeting the needs of the users and the patients. Yeah, Matt, I mean, I, I, I think everyone understands the idea, right, of virtualization and moving to the cloud. And I think we all see that as the future. But was there some fear on your part, right, to push such an important piece of infrastructure? I mean, when, whenever there's a, a ransomware incident, we see how, how important the EHR is. Was there some fear pushing that to the cloud and virtualizing it? Or, or did you just do enough tests that you were comfortable <laughs> No, no, there wasn't. You know, coming to Centera and Optima Health, I, I had already done cloud technology. I've done over 200 cloud strategies for Fortune, you know, the Fortune 100, and also hyperconverged strategies um, for VMware. Um, doing Costco's initial analysis on doing hyperconverged, you know, years ago. This isn't any new technology. This technology has been around for, you know, as long as I've been doing technology. You know, one of the things was VMware's the industrial standard and virtualization. It's also now, you know, very much so adjacent with uh, AWS, Azure, Google, you know, you can run these workloads in those clouds leveraging, you know, VMware's technology. So it, it's it's not something that was scary. The scary part was not moving it, you know. Mm-hmm. A lot of the ransomware I've seen now, you know, being an advisor for, for a lot of healthcare's, um, that's wants to see how we we're, we're building our workloads and where we're putting them. The, the scary part is when they're breached, it's, it's not in the cloud. It's not in the hyperconverged portion. It's in the legacy stack. That's, that's, you know, where, where breaches are happening. It's happening in your old legacy. I don't want to use the competitor's name, but in the old legacy Citrix environment that hasn't been patched or hasn't been maintained in decades, it's sitting behind a public facing website That's where you're getting breached, where dual factor authentication was never in play. You know, the breaches that are happening in healthcare aren't here. That's it's it's where you don't actually address and and you're leaving those legacy systems running just because um, somebody said we still need them or somebody said they just can't retire them yet because of some type of medical records that we need to keep for forever. (laughs) Again, it's that's the dangerous part is is not leveraging modern technology not actually talking to to vmware and and chris and and understanding you know where where we need to go um burying your head in the sand now isn't isn't an excuse you know they used to say uh if you went you know if you didn't do anything and you maintain consistency you're going to keep your job that's not the case you're going to get breached you're going to uh, have poorly performing systems. So again, times have definitely changed as far as security posture and as far as um, cloud and hyper-converged cloud, uh, hyper, uh, you know, hybrid multi-cloud is is yeah. truly the term. Yeah. yeah, and I just want to pile on just a little bit there because I love this this conversation that we're constantly getting engaged with about the siloed and legacy nature of healthcare. It's a tough one to break, um, and a lot of organizations don't go that route because culturally they think it's safe to stay doing what you do, yep. right? And, you know, if we continue to win, we're going to continue this batting order lineup to make a baseball reference the same exact way every single time because it, it produces results. The, the, you know, the difference here is that are we looking for the same result over and over again in healthcare? No. 
I think the dynamic nature of care delivery requires us to think differently about how we use technology to solve the most pressing patient care issues. And as we dive into new worlds like treating populations or quality-based care or looking at social determinants of health, the old siloed legacy way we do it is not going to work. You need to get those workloads closer to the patient. You need to get those workloads closer to microservices so you can take advantage of somebody else's innovation, which you don't have in house. But there's that cultural fear across healthcare organizations about, well, if we do this and it goes sideways, do I lose my job? And I'm gonna agree with Matt. I think if you don't do this now and it goes sideways because you've done it the same way all the time, you're more at risk to lose your job because you're not progressing healthcare to where it truly needs to be. And then if you look at it from the perspective of security and risk, you know, again, Matt's spot on here at the same exact time as that, that legacy nature creates these very complex operational models because now you're managing multiple hardware platforms. You're managing different configurations. You have to keep up with what you already have in place. That doesn't give you the opportunity to journey into that new world where, I can now seamlessly and frictionlessly operate these workloads because I'm using that virtualized layer across that hybrid cloud model and take advantage of that new world that's out there. I'm creating more risk by doing it the old standard way that we used to because nobody's maintaining that legacy environment, right? And then I got people on keyboards ugh, and that's probably the most risky aspect of any type of IT environment anyways is because people want to do the right thing and they're thinking they're doing the right thing. Nine times out of 10, they're not but you're enabling some bad behaviors because that legacy technologies continue to sit there. We're really looking at how to smooth out and create that frictionless experience and really embed or ingrain security into the DNA of the fabric of how this workload moves, how it operates, where it lives and breathes. Security is not a bolt-on. It's, it's part of the DNA of what we're trying to accomplish to solve some of those pressing technology needs to deliver better patient care. Yeah. I like to say that ignorance is bliss until it's not. Oh, yeah. Not in healthcare. Not in healthcare anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing. I think the the acceleration of breaches and challenges, uh, you know, has made it so that you know you, it doesn't last long. So. I think that's the challenge and, and, and doing nothing is a problem, right? So, uh, I, you know, I think that we, we underestimate how doing nothing adds up over time and, and then we get into a, a real rut. So, so tell us a little bit about the rollout, Matt. Uh, you know, what are we talking about? You know, how many concurrent users, you know, hey, how did this uh, go and what was the impact on your organization? You know, one of, the, one of the biggest impacts was the return on the investment. Um, we actually ended up lowering our overall uh, spend for virtualization, for, for the presentation portion of Epic, which is, you know, the uh, hyperspace. Lowering that uh, operating cost was, was in the millions, you know. Moving from one old legacy platform to a new platform, uh, actually make actually made it um, cheaper to run with less management less overhead uh, the actual deployment started out as a semi um, semi uh, virtualized effort and then moving it to a completely virtualized workload uh, running full vsan running a full image being able to shift shift our um, when we had, when we had to do patching, when we had to do those things, way less management, you know, it took, it used to take us, you know, to manage an environment. Now we're using three people to manage an environment. That was, that was very significant. And the deployment was, was quick. I mean, it was the biggest thing was acquiring the hardware. VMware actually assigned engineers. We went through several iterations to enhance the product to run perfectly with Epic. Well, I think we we worked with VMware and Epic and uh, our teams. We, we ended up doing, I want to say, about 100 different iterations so that we got it to precisely where we're, wow. we were meeting exactly the, the needs we had, we had with Epic. Uh, and us doing that, now we've actually done the work for a lot of other healthcares that were able to, to deploy the same, same scenario. Well, and you were able to do that during COVID. I mean, how, how did COVID-19 impact this, this effort? Uh, it's, it's kind of amazing that you did it <laughs> with everything that was so, going on. <laughs> so it was, it was multifold, you know, COVID, uh, I had I actually had a, another interview with Chris during the middle of COVID. I mean, I was in my car trying <laughs> to get food, you know, in the middle of an upgrade. We, we had, we had done another interview. Um, 
<coughs> I'm very tired, you know. I, I'm finally getting to to recuperate and recover from from the 24 seven, you know, working on on this project plus others. You know, interoperability is one of the big subjects now. Is how do we inter exchange data across healthcare? Well, again, we need to leverage, you know hyper-converged technology, hybrid cloud technology, leveraging old antiquated systems is not going to work with interoperability. You know, it's a mandate uh, by the government. Yeah. Chris, anything you'd add as far as like how COVID-19 impacts this and, and maybe some of the benefits of having an infrastructure like this? Because, you, you know, you talk to a lot of healthcare organizations and, you know, what are the benefits that this can provide, especially during COVID as, as we needed to scale or, or downplay or do it remote or what kind of benefits have you seen? Yeah, well, I, I think there's a key takeaway here. Outside of the back end data center, what's taking shape across that multi-cloud world, right? The user has an expectation of an experience. And I think that's the key takeaway because what we were able to do and what we've seen time and time again is as we simplified the operations of the IT department to really deliver that experience that the user is expecting, you're creating a frictionless environment, right? I don't care. And, and when COVID hit, the mad rush was to, well, how do I keep these people working? Well, other industries, they had to do that in a very timely manner. Healthcare kind of kept a portion of the workforce here because you're going to take patients on the floor, but then using some of what we learned with the technology and then moving some of those non-essential workers home, you create an experience for them to be able to work the same exact way they did, whether they're at their desk within the hospital or within the home. The platform was the key there. You know, running that platform in specific locations becomes the icing on the cake. You know, one of the things that complementary to Centera is that they took that presentation layer and they're running it someplace else. You know, that's a scary thought process for a lot of CTOs and CIOs out there. It's like, well, if I'm decoupling these systems, what is the performance going to be like? Well, through the iteration of building out that standardized platform and creating those operations for them, they were able to seamlessly move those workloads and create that same exact experience. And that's what everybody's starting to look for. And I think as you're looking forward and what we've learned over COVID is that now patients and even your employees want more digital experience. They're now demanding or expecting more digital experience with this platform approach to be able to deliver that application on any cloud across any device. You now have the tenant or the framework to start to meet those needs and take on the innovation by seamlessly running your operations, creating that frictionless experience and having a happy user at the end of the day. Because there's nothing worse than trying to get access to patient data when I'm trying to make a diagnosis and it's not available to me. So the availability of that information in a seamless manner that works the way I expect it to work, because that's how the technology is supposed to run as I've consumerized my entire life up until this point. It's a, it's a win-win for healthcare at the end of the day, especially with the changing dynamics models for how healthcare is being delivered. The beauty now is that now we're giving people the option. So if you look at a lot of the major health systems, they're making these declarations about running to a public cloud. I say you're never going to be in a full public cloud. It's always going to be a hybrid type model. And the reason why is there's some applications you're just not going to be able to move, but you need to put the tenets of cloud computing surrounding those applications. And I believe that's where hyperconverged starts to play that role, right? The idea of I virtualized all my compute, my network, my storage, I've, I've standardized all my operations. I've taken advantage of the tenets of automation and orchestration. I'm now running a cloud. I can put that thing anywhere in the world that I want and expect it to operate a very specific or certain way. So I may have some hiccups here or there based upon not understanding the application portfolio, but I've already created an environment where I can satisfy those needs, deliver that service and create that experience that the user is so much dying to, to take advantage of today. One of the, now, one of the newest things is, is PAX. So PAX is all the ologies, you know, the, the radiology, brain x-rays, chest x-rays. You know, one of the things was deconstructed PAX for us. We ended up uh, looking at ways to get away from, again, the legacy PAX systems that were unique, antiquated, running in the hospital. You couldn't actually centrally manage them. The clinicians were, you know, we had hundreds of clinicians all over running their own individual PACs. Um, centralizing our packs and using hyperconverged technology, using hybrid cloud has, again, it's another application, huge workload, huge amounts of data, leveraging a company called Faction. Faction is uh, cloud adjacent. Uh, Faction is a, a, a partner with Dell, VMware, 
uh, centralizing our data in a central location and then using that hyperconverged compute in, in Equinix was huge for us. That was a huge, again, another return on our investment, a huge multi-million dollar reduction in cost, huge improvement in performance, huge, you know, leveraging virtualized infrastructure as opposed to the old antiquated physical infrastructure that we had to pay, you know, millions of dollars to maintain this proprietary system. Again, VMware strikes again, another great solution, uh, not just our EMR, but our PAC systems. That was same similar solution. Uh, this time we got to do some some big data analytics in a centralized location. Is there times where it's not the right solution though? Are there some situations where you're like, no, we need this on traditional infrastructure. We don't want to virtualize it, or, or maybe we don't want to put it on the cloud. Like Chris said, you know that you really need the the on site or on premise stuff. Um, we actually use it as our edge nodes. You know, we use vSAN at every single hospital as our edge nodes. I, I don't find a, um, you know, running NSX for security. One of the things is is securing our remote locations now. Um, using a vSAN, you know, um, ready nodes at the edge, eliminating full data centers on our hospital, just using this little compute stack. To, to run that hospital, I, I, I'm actually finding more reasons to use it than not use it yeah. uh, because of the security, the scalability, uh, the ability to manage it in a consistent way across all, all of our hospital systems. Again, like, like Chris was saying, it's getting, getting the data where the patients need it and where the doctors need it in order to make you know, advanced diagnostics. You know, during COVID, it was super important to have that scale where we needed it. And the pre-investment in these vSAN ready nodes was huge because right now we, we ended up deploying these across all of our hospitals. So now when we have a demand at our hospitals or somebody has this little application that some doctor found, one is for stroke patients, you know, real important. Uh, the the time to diagnose a stroke patient and do the coilization in the brain or to, to administer medication is is seconds is minutes and it, it requires you know precise uh, applications and precise um, precision medicine so having you know this, these systems available these new systems available when they ask us to deploy uh, deploy new stroke you know, uh, applications to, to do these type of diagnosis before it take us six months to buy hardware. It would take six months to get the, you know, it'd take several months to get the hardware, it'd take us time to, to, to configure their hardware, yeah. get it racked, get all these things. Now having that hyper-converged infrastructure at where I need it at scale across the, the entire, you know, enterprise, it takes me a day or a week to deploy that same application anywhere, anytime, you know, in the demand so Chris was saying, the demand that I'm seeing now, the ideal demands that are coming in are just nonstop daily. We've, we've opened the floodgates of, hey, we can accomplish things now. So everybody knows we can accomplish things. So everybody has this new project they want to put in. And, and it's, you know, IT has become, you know, very critical in the healthcare landscape because we're enabling new ways of treatment. We're enabling new, new ways of, you know, interoperability of data. So so again, the, this this technology is is definitely supercharged uh, the the ideal and the thought process inside of healthcare. That's great. Yeah, and the, and the piggyback on John because the question you asked was: Are some applications not quite ready? Yeah, I mean, it really depends upon the organization. Again, I think what Matt has alluded to is that when you have organizations that are just starting on this journey, there's hesitancy, right? There'll be hesitancy to look at applications and move them. And maybe that could be just from a lack of understanding of the, the true, how this asset works, how this application interfaces, what are the hooks and ties into it? Because the last thing you want to do is move an application and all of a sudden there's a critical function in the background. There's a connection somewhere and somebody's not getting data anymore, right? It creates a strain on how patient care can be delivered. But I think the more mature an organization is, as they're thinking about cloud, not as a destination, but as an operating model, right? So being able to take advantage of those tenants across, regardless of where the physical location is, you're going to see more application move. Um, I think one thing healthcare has suffered from, and again, I'll say this is my own personal opinion, have been from the other side of the desk is application sprawl is horrible. 
If you talk to any CIO today and ask them what they're managing from a portfolio perspective, it's not uncommon to find a two, three, four hospital health system say, oh, we have 2000 applications. That's bananas. Okay. <laughs> Somebody needs to go back and rationalize what's going on there because there's some cost savings that could happen. And there's some seamless operational advantages to reducing what that portfolio is because then now you can start to look at taking advantage of those applications in new and dynamic ways. So I just think it really boils down to the maturity of the organization, how they're using cloud primarily either as a destination because they want to be there or as part of their standard operating model. Yeah. Well, this was an awesome discussion. And uh, to, to use Chris's phrase, uh, uh, I think many people will probably think it's bananas that you moved Epic this way. So thanks for trailblazing, because I, I think with the, I think everyone wants to do it, right? <laughs> they want the virtualization, they want the cloud, but they want to do it in a safe way. So thanks for trailblazing that for us. More ahead with, with Epic migration, you know, one of the biggest workloads at Epic is the reporting workload, the Clarity, Caboodle, Cajito, all those, those things. And, you know, we have been, we've been able to, to leverage, you know, true cloud nature for that. And, you know, now we're leveraging, you know, scale sets for applications in cloud. Um, so, you know, it, it's, a, it's a mix of putting things in hybrid cloud, leveraging hyperconverge and let's say Equinix running vSAN or doing native cloud. Um, it, it, that's really the placement. Is there some applications you're saying that can't run or this? No, nah, it's more, where do we place these applications? Where is the return on investment? Where is the low latency that we need? You're going to get lower latency on a, on a hybrid, hyper-converged technology than in cloud. You know, you don't have to take all these hops in the cloud. And there's a lot of hops between the hospital and Azure, AWS, and Google. There's a lot of things that that needs to go through. When you need lower latency, you're going to pick that you know, from the hospital to my hyperconverged stack in the hospital or to my hyperconverged stack in Equinix. It's only two hops as opposed to 50. So again, it's it's really the delicacy of the application. Yeah. Yeah. Great way to frame it. Thanks so much, guys. I appreciate you sharing this experience. I'm sure our healthcare IT today audience will love it. So uh, if you're watching, uh, thanks for watching and be sure to check out all the great content at healthcareittoday.com. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, guys. Thank Have a great day. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.